Sarah, is there anything that you want to mention? I think, I think the word you were looking for earlier was vulnerable in a vulnerable um, in a vulnerable position. So I completely agree uh, that having a written process, I just want to emphasize what Emily said about that is going to be really pertinent at your local levels uh, to help with some of these ongoing conversations that we hear uh, and deal with every year uh, with a new population of students coming in. And so um, in that written process, I just want to emphasize too what Emily said about uh, making sure you involve two people. And who are those two people going to be in your districts? Um, you know, and they can be a variety of people that you employ. Um, you know, uh, toileting is an ADL, it's an activity of daily living. Um, so looking at it through that lens is really important. And um, utilizing uh, the other thing that came to mind as you were talking, Emily, is that it takes a village. So um, this cannot fall on just one person. This will not be successful if it falls on one person. So really thinking about the village that you employ and working with your staff. So there is a comfort level that can be gained there uh, while we are, um, you know, encouraging independence for independence as possible. I guess the only thing, the only other thing I would add is that when you are, when you do have, create a plan with a, um, with a parent for, um, for a toileting plan for a, for a student, is that really asking the parent what, what their goals are and what, um, what are their priorities? What do they how do they want their you know, take the parents' input on um on what those goals would be for what does success look like for my child? Emily or Sarah, are there any considerations uh if a child has um an identified disability? Well, if they have an identified disability, you still need to take care of the child. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's, so whether they have a disability or they don't have a disability, you still need to make sure that they are clean and dry and and, um, and able to access their education. If there is a, a medical need that, um, that might require some nursing services, then of course you would involve your nurse. Um, there are students that have a colostomy, for example, that might be beyond what your classroom teacher would want to to um, take care of. So absolutely. So if there are medical issues, you need to make sure you're including the nurse in the planning and um, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I'm really trying to pepper folks with uh, questions that I know we've been hearing um, and so I just want to make sure. Um, I, I think uh, we've got a question from Kathy Beal. Kathy? It might be faster if I ask instead of type. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Well, um, we're a very, very small school. We have a part-time nurse. We don't have many ed tech. The concern we're having is with pre-K falling on the classroom teacher. And who else is there to help? We have like one pre-K teacher, we'll say. The kindergarten teacher is not gonna be able to pop over from next door. Um, right. We don't have, you know, the ed, te well, ed techs we have may have coverage on something else. Um, special, you know, what, what what do you, do? and it could be the kids not even special ed. So, I mean, you know, what, what do you do with a small school that doesn't have nurses and doesn't have ed techs and has one bathroom is, and it is this big and it's, <laughs> you don't have the facility. And we have kids right now who are not told to and we're dealing with it, but yeah. it, it's not an easy situation because you don't have two people all the time. You, you can have two people all the time. You, you need to, but what do you do if you don't have that? Yeah, I, Lou, I saw you come off uh, mic or uh, come on camera and Emily, if I'm gonna let you guys sort of chime in. Well, Kathy, uh, I, I just left the district she works in. She's yeah. talking about, school of maybe 36 kids and they have two a couple of students with level three autism yeah. um, so the impossibility of recruiting ed techs in tiny little places we 
you know, they do the best patchwork they can. Sometimes they'll grab a special ed teacher, but that means yeah. someone else has to watch the kids they're working with. Um, it's extraordinarily difficult in tiny rural schools to operate uh, appropriately. So, Kathy, if I'm not mistaken, we just keep doing whatever the yes. heck we can I, do, right? Yeah, I just wanted to just, I, I, I understand the protocols and, I, and they're very important, but as you say, we just... We we can't always we do it as best as we can and we put the child's needs as you know first but sometimes it's not it's not as yeah done as yeah, it yeah. have it and I understand that and that's um you know if and especially if you have students that are you know this is happening with these students you can make a plan with the parents they can understand that okay this is what this is what we're gonna do this right. is our plan right. um. We can only have one person in there, but we're going to let somebody know or, you know, what, whatever the plan is, but it's communicated with the family. So they know the expectations, they know what's, what's happening. And we are working with parents and it's, and it's two kiddos who are, are completely not toilet trained. Yeah. And it's like, so it's not even like an accident because kids have accidents at different ages. We know that, but right. you know, this is, it's hard to find. I mean, a kiddo has to go at 11 o'clock and then at the one o'clock, whatever you, you just, we don't have the staff again and say, okay, we're going to make a plan. We, we can do it in some instances, but sometimes we cannot. So one person grabs and goes and, you know, and, and parents are aware. We've worked with parents and talked about the toiling, but I just want to kind of re reiterate that because we have so few resources that sometimes you guys all talk about that. I'd love to have that was just like, we just may do the best we can. Yeah. <laughs> um, so far, so good. But <laughs> Thank and, you. And I know that, uh, you know, in, in bigger districts, you could maybe commandeer an ed tech from another school, but the school district that Kathy's working in is very unique in that they're separate school districts. This one yeah. particular school is its own school district. So as special ed director the last five years, I couldn't bark over to the other school and say, right. hey, we need you down here for a week. Right. We were barred from doing that. So the answer um, that we talked about, Kathy, and that is not coming to fruition is recruitment of qualified folks, even some unqualified people. Yes. To some, come yeah, work for right. us. And, and boy, <laughs> in Washington County, it is near impossible. Mm. Just a real head scratching shame. And I'm yeah. sure there's lots of other rural areas like ours that are familiar with this. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. I just want to share. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. Good sharing, Kathy. I remember. <laughs> you know, the other thing I remember, I I worked with, God, I don't know how many thousands of kids and parents over the years. And the one thing that every parent ever talked to me about three and four and five and even eight and nine-year-olds, they would give their anything to have their kids toilet trained. There's nothing like this lady I worked with, her 10-year-old kid with Down syndrome never did become toilet trained at all. And it's a mess. And the one thing that every parent wants, and, and Megan, I don't know if you remember, we had Potty University in Portland. Does anyone remember back then? It was an intense potty uh, training program using ABA. Uh, and kids would send their, uh, parents would send their kids down there. And it was very successful for most kids. Hmm. But there is no potty you anymore. And even if they were, no one in Washington County, Kathy, could get down to Portland every day for a, a PU training, you know. An unfortunate abbreviation, but maybe apt. <laughs> Susie, yeah. I saw you had your hand up and then you put your hand down. Is it part of the, you know, yeah, put your part hand of up? The conversation. No. So um, if the goal is, you know, to get to independence with our kids um, with disabilities. And I like what you talked about is like kind of pre-planning some toileting times where we take the child in um, to try to go to prevent, you know, from soiling the diapers. That's, a, you know, a great approach. Um, you know, other people that are resources for you are occupational therapists are great at um, kind of helping to devise a toileting plan to teach children how to use the bathroom how to use those visual supports for your kids with autism um, and helping them to understand, you know, the kids themselves to understand what the goal is and, um, you know, to kind of build that toileting plan where if you have some times during the day that we can start to bring in some adults to either cover the classroom or cover the bathroom and to have that additional support in that classroom, you know, like at least one time 
And um, so I don't know, we, we are we have some additional toileting resources that we're planning to put up on the website um, to make available for you, but I can include that information if that's okay um, with our team or um, resources that I have from um, some occupational therapy um, research about um, how to, you know, to have toileting be a, an activity for our preschool age children. That would be great, Susie. If you can share those with Jen, we'll make sure that we incorporate those into the materials that, that uh, Emily has shared. Uh, Deborah Jean? So at VZ, we we have um, a number of three-year-olds now in re regard in relationship to also our four-year-olds who are not potty trained. And we do have a very set protocol that we use. And why it works is because we have built our IEPs for toilet training into our IEP goals. Our parents are fully on board and we use the same protocol for every child and we have the same goals for every child. But what we do, how we individualize it is ask the parent, what is their preference in terms of how they start? If it's a boy, do you want your child standing or do you want your child sitting? That's the, that's the only way we differentiate it. Every parent is so thankful that we have taken on this task. There is not a parent who has balked and said, no, we do not want you to, to toilet chain our, our, our child. The other thing that we find is that we are able to keep all staff involved in it because we rotate our staff. And we always have two staff on the toilet training project. And our, our toilet training is scheduled. And it is set up for the individual needs of the child. We know when the child basically are ready to go because of what time they come in. Our three-year-olds come in at different times throughout the day. And so they come when they first come in, they go to the bathroom. An hour and a half later, we take them to the toilet again. Before they leave, they go to the bathroom again. So it's fairly routine. So our it's all part of their schedule. And so their staff who are working with them are part of their routine. And everybody's using the same procedures every single time. So it, it becomes part of the day-to-day -day learning for the child as well. And I think if you make it part of that, it doesn't become a burden. It doesn't become a task. It's just part of the educational programming for the child. It's I, just I, my two cents. I think you're right for 90% of the kids and 90% of the parents. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that when I left uh, the Jonesport area, we had consulted with OTs. We had a regular protocol in place. But unfortunately, we didn't have ever two staff to do this with. We had one when we could. Uh, the other problem was our parents were on, on board with it. I mean, they were on board. They weren't with, on board? You're saying they were, they were not. They were very on board with what we're doing at school, but I know at home they didn't follow through. They basically, well, we asked them to. We asked them to. We said, this sure, we is the do. deal. Of course we do. Yeah, yeah. But they didn't. <laughs> and mm -hmm. there is that, yeah, they, We have met with parents this year already several times, and we've step by step, we had OT involved. We've yep. had people yep. involved. We've yep. had we we really want to help the parents because it, it, to make this process work, we've got a schedule with this kiddo. But as you say, even with one staff member, the parents are not on board with this, and they have another kiddo coming in next year, who's same situation. Yeah. Level one, three, three at this point, yeah. Happening. And we don't have staff. We don't. We have an OT who's here three hours a week tops. We have yeah. our, our OT does it, our speech person does it, whoever is here working with that child during that scheduled time is part of that process. Wow. You're That's so awesome. lucky. And it is challenging <laughs> you know, when, when, the, when, when you don't feel that it's being followed at home, but yes. you know, ultimately you can only control what happens right. while they're in your building. Right. And That's how we look it. at it. And that's how we look at it. Look at this is what we're doing. This is what we're asking you to do. If you want your child to do this, and this is what we do for every single thing that we're working on with that child. So I'm sure most parents would jump on board. I, I would think most parents would. We just have a situation that's somewhat unique. Yeah. yeah. I think, Deborah Jean, you're right. I mean, the protocol you describe are protocols we've been using for, for years, for decades, and they're very effective when you have the staff that you can rotate, when you have the parents that are mm -hmm, have mm -hmm. follow through at home, very, very effective. And 
probably successful 80, 85% of the time. Some students, unfortunately, will never get there. It happens. But generally, by and large, the toileting protocol you're describing is uh, it's textbook. It works for most kids. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't. And that's what Kathy and I were dealing with for the last couple of years. But say la vie, right? Yes. I just want to say, Deborah Jane, I'm so glad you mentioned the, the importance of routine and how it does work with a number of students. And the earlier link that um, we put in the chat, the Toileting Resource Guide, it has a number of um, resources at the end of it. And within those resources, there's a, some really great visuals if you're working on a routine schedule with some of your students um, that could be printed, could be laminated, could be put in certain places um, that would help as teaching tools to uh, depending on the level of your students you're working with. Terrific. Well, thank you very much. Um, are there other questions related to uh, toileting? Kathy Beal, thank you very much for jumping in and, and raising that those questions because, you know, we're all coming from different experiences. And also, as we mentioned over and over again, the resources available for each school and each program are just very different. And so it's really helpful um, for folks to speak up to say, well, in our situation, here are the needs and here's how we've managed. And that kind of sharing uh, sort of the collective experience is really valuable uh, to making sure that we're, you know, that there's sort of a community of practice here and that we're all learning together. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, other questions uh, related to um, to toileting uh, before we do like the ultimate in change ups and go to data. <laughs> All right. Well, Sarah Decato and Emily Poland, thank you very much from the coordinated health team. I don't know why I said integrated before, but it's just going to be a day of like, whoops, because I also said that Lori Whittemore had been on our calendar to speak. No, it was Tracy Whitlock. And so I think I was looking at you, Lori, in, in my, my Zoom box. Um, but um, we have set aside some time today to talk a little bit about the data. Um, thank you very much, Emily and Sarah. Um, we're talking about data, if you want to hang out, uh, to uh, to review our frequently asked questions um, that have come up related to data entry um, and enrollment information. And our colleague, Ali Cookson, is here um, somewhere. Uh, Ali, there you are. Um, so, Ali, if you can jump in and, and walk people through some of the FAQs, I want to express appreciation to Kim Hall and, and Ali, who I know have been having a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations um, as always, our goal is to be, you know, as immediately responsive uh, to folks. And so we appreciate people reaching out and saying, I need help with this, or I have questions about that. So thank you, Kim and Allie, for, re for working with folks. And thank you to those people who've reached out. So no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Allie and Kim, who are here to talk about uh, data FAQs. Thanks, Megan. I'm actually going to lob this one over to Kim. I knew that was coming. Um, <laughs> So I have reached out to uh, mostly the business managers and data specialists for the cohort one SAUs um, and talk to them about entering the kids in synergy and all of the things that fall into that. The, the main question that we're getting about enrollment is how to enroll a student that's not physically in their school. Um, what we have recommended is to create a pseudo classroom so that they actually have a place to put these kids in their SIS system. Um, there's been questions about whether or not they have to track attendance. Uh, we recommend that they track it as present remote. Um, it's not going to affect their chronic absenteeism because these kids are exempt from, uh, they're not age, compulsory age. Um, those are the bulk of the questions. I, I would be more than willing to do a Q and A if anybody has anything else that's, you know, burning in your mind that we could possibly help with. One of the things that, that this highlighted for us was um, as we've walked through the, um, uh, the scenarios, 
we've really been focusing on sort of like coding and those kinds of things. But we realized that for each of the scenarios that um, Susie used, was taking us through in the past few weeks, including an additional line to say, is there guidance related to, um, to enrollment information, um, particularly in some of the, the nuanced uh, cases that we've referred to. So, um, so that was really the purpose of making sure that we were all on the same page. And this question came up a little bit last week. So we wanted to make sure we had folks on the line to talk to you today. Um, Beth, I see your hand up. Yeah, I want to thank the team because they spent an hour and a half with York and Kittery at the beginning of the week, and it was very helpful. Um, I think we're still coming up. So we did create a small school within our power school system. We call it the ECI school, but we're still struggling with pieces um, involving information that parents would be required to provide us when they're not attending. And the explanation is really confusing for families. So I just think, you know, I, I, we, I think we can figure it out for this year. I manually entered everybody into our system. Uh, we're, we've got things in there, but I think for the long term, we have to think of something, some other process perhaps, because as this rolls out with more and more districts, we're gonna have more and more unique characteristics to the service delivery model for every single district. And when you have a child that's not receiving any services in your school, we're going out to the preschools. It's really confusing as to why they need to provide vaccination information and residency information because they're already enrolled and they've already provided vaccination information to the pre-K. So it's just just a thought. Like we're okay for now, but I think for the long-term sustainability of this program, we we could we got to figure out a way to make it more seamless and make sense for families too, so that they don't feel like they're giving us. Um, you know, somewhat protected information um, in their language survey and other things before they've actually started attending with us. Thanks, Beth. That's very good insight. And and please know that that our team meets uh, multiple times a week, and we come back together and say things like, "Okay, this is the." solve it for cohort one. Now we need a plan for cohort two and beyond. Uh, Sandy, I see your hand up. Catherine, your hand is up, but I'm gonna to jump to Sandy just in case she's boarding and is gonna whisper something to us before she goes through security. Hi there. I um, just wanted to say that we can easily embed that the registration piece into the part C to part B transition process so that we are educating families early on about what this would look like when they move to Part B, that registering within the school district is part of that process. So thank you, Beth. All right, thanks, Sandy. Uh, Catherine? Yeah, I just wanted to thank Kimberly and, and Alex and uh, Paula and Ka uh, Kathy Warren for they met with our district last Friday um, and we sent out a very simple cover letter two of the families that are not currently in our preschools, along with a questionnaire as, as quick, as basic as it, with a um, due date of the 15th with a promise of a swag bag with a couple of like board books and puzzles and crayons in it. So that we're, we're encouraging the families to turn it back as quickly as possible. We put a self-addressed envelope in there and then we have also invited them to actually come to the central office if they have questions and we'll have the bags here as well. So we're hoping that that turns into a, uh, meeting the deadlines is, and getting the data that we need. Thanks. Good idea. That was a great idea. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Um, and and thank you also to our obviously our finance folks, Paula. Everybody has been all hands on deck. Ida, thank you. Um, do want to just say, you know, part of the purpose of these conversations weekly is to really kind of build a sense of the community of practice. And so um, what we may be doing outside of these meetings is doing some outreach to you to say, hey, Catherine, you mentioned the other day that you had sent out a letter with a, a couple survey questions. Would you mind sharing that? And so as we can begin, you know, or even um, Deborah Jean, you know, mentioning your protocol, um, you know, beginning to gather some of the materials that that you all have put together sort of with the idea of, of having a, um, a repository of of resources that um, not only cohort one schools can can sort of capitalize on, but as we go forward. But I do love the idea of the swag bag. 
Yeah, and I, we you did it as a pre-registration to the family so that to tell them that, you know, we're working with CDS and this is going to help them in the future and make it simpler down the line when they get ready to register. So hopefully it works. <laughs> That's awesome. Look forward to hear how that goes. Um, Lori Whittemore. No, just raising your hand. Just. <laughs> um, other questions or uh, needs? Um, things that we want to make sure that we address in our forthcoming meetings uh, or any other questions related to data uh, collection uh, enrollment um, or any challenging scenarios we want to make sure that we note so we can get back to folks. I don't know, Megan, if we do we want to mention that we are trying to come up with a tool for the schools to use to record um, child outcomes data and transition data, and that that should be available coming up here in the not too distant future. Yeah, exactly. And we, we, as a, we as a team have been identifying some different resources that we think would be helpful for you. Um, and so are, are, you know, working together as our individual office units, but as well as across uh, across the department to try to identify things. So the more that you ask us, uh, the better we're going to be able to, to fine tune and target um, resources for you, including um, the resource that Susie just mentioned. So the more questions that you raise uh, with us in this forum or even individually, the better positioned we're gonna be to be able to, to put together resources that are really meaningful, meaningfully supportive for you. All right. Well, as I mentioned before, it was going to be a little bit shorter because uh, we had to, to shift one of our presentations to next week. Um, but if we have no other questions, um, I'll give it another second or two just in case somebody's desperately looking for their uh, their mic button to come off mute. All right. Well, then we'll go ahead and turn off the recording and uh, I'll invite everybody to have a fabulous Wednesday and an even better week. Thank you very much.